This conference will now be recorded. Hello, thank you for joining us for the RTGR Law presentation on COVID-19 workers' compensation presumptions. We're going to be focusing today on SB 1159, which is the presumption bill that has passed the California legislature and is awaiting signature from Governor Newsom. Folks who follow uh, this legis who have followed this legislation and others are predicting that the governor will sign the bill because his office was uh, participated in its passage. We're going to cover the bill in, in detail today. Um, and if during the course of the presentation you have questions about the program, about the presumption law, uh, or if you would like a PDF copy of this PowerPoint that you can share with your colleagues and coworkers, please send us an email. We'll be happy to answer those questions uh, or, and or forward you a copy of the uh, PDF of the PowerPoint. All you have to do is find your nearest RTGR law office and uh, there are the email addresses. We make them pretty easy to find. So for example, Orange County is OC at rtgrlaw.com. On our website, you also find a link to all of these uh, email addresses on our offices uh, page on our website. And I'll have a duplicate copy of this slide at the end of the presentation. So you can send your questions while you're participating, or you can send your questions uh, afterwards if you think of them later, or if you have a COVID case that comes up and you want uh, our input, we're happy to provide that to you. We have our most senior attorney at each of those offices uh, standing by to receive your email and answer your questions, and they all have copies of the PDF to send to you. A disclaimer, please. This is a condensed, summarized, educational presentation for information only. It is not a substitute for legal advice. We're happy to provide you with that legal advice if you get in contact with us, but uh, you know, please double check the law itself and, and seek legal advice on any particular uh, legal question that you might have involving COVID or, uh, or anything else complicated. So let's start by uh, asking what does a presumption do in the context of California workers' compensation? Because uh, we, we need to know what that means uh, to start discussing what the what the presumption does. So in a normal workers' compensation case, uh, a back injury on the job, it is the employee who has the burden of proof in California to prove that there was an injury or illness. And he or she can do that by showing that the injury was proximately caused by work, arose out of employment, and occurred during the course of employment. Generally, we summarize this as AOE, COE. And what that means is uh, this is the first step for an employee to recover workers' compensation benefits is to prove that. Sometimes it's not hard to prove. They can have a treating physician's report or a statement of injury or their own testimony, and that may be sufficient to prove that there was an injury. Once they've done that, they've met their burden and the case can go on. But if the employee doesn't have any such evidence or there are contradictory statements or there is no medical report or the medical report itself is contradictory or there's conflicting medical evidence, then the employee may not be able to prove that the injury arose out of work and won't recover workers' compensation benefits. But the first step is, for, is in the hands of the employee. What a presumption does is it relieves the employee of that burden by creating a legal fiction that certain condition that if certain conditions are met, a specific injury or illness, in this case COVID-19, was contracted at work. Therefore, it becomes the responsibility of the employer to disprove that the COVID-19 was work-related if a presumption applies. And we're going to talk today about what happens when the presumption does apply and also what happens when it doesn't apply. So it's very important uh, to know if the presumption applies when it comes to COVID-19, and we'll explain why. SB 1159 is the presumption law now pending um, uh, at the, on the desk of the governor, as they say. And the governor has until September 30th to either sign or veto the bill. But again, it's anticipated that he will sign it, and it's probably going to happen sooner rather than later. Um, it was passed on an emergency basis, which means that uh, once the governor signs it, SB 1159, which is expected to do, it will become law immediately. What it will do specifically, mainly, 
is uh, put into place three different labor code sections. You'll see that they are all part of labor code section 3212, and 3212 is the neighborhood of the labor code where all the other presumptions live. So the heart and cancer presumption, for example, a hernia presumption that apply to safety officers, for example, uh, you'll find it in 3212 in that area of the labor code. What this does is it adds or would add 3212.86, 3212.87, and 3212.88. And each of those are three, those are three separate presumption laws that apply to different classes of employees in different contexts. 3212.86, the first one, mostly what it does is it turns the governor's executive order that created the COVID-19 presumption, it turns it into a statute. So basically 3212.86 would um, become, or I'm sorry, the executive order would become 3212.86 once enacted. It would continue to apply to injuries or death resulting from COVID-19 on or after March 19, 2020 through July 5, 2020. It covers that same window of time as the executive order that we've been living with now for a few months. As with the executive order, 3212.86 applies to any employee in California, not just essential uh, workers or first responders. The COVID-19 related illness would be presumed to arise out of and occur during the course of employment if all of the criteria are met. And this is, you'll see it's the same criteria that was in place with the executive order is now or will be in place with 3212.86 if it becomes law. Those are four separate criteria. Number one is work time proximity. So it, the uh, employee has to have performed labor or services on or after March 19, 2020 for this to apply. Uh, there is no presumption and will be no presumption in California, presumably for any employee prior to March 19, 2020. Number two is there has to be a positive test or diagnosis. This means that the employee either had a positive COVID-19 test as we generally understand it, or was diagnosed by a California physician with COVID-19. Either one will work to start the process. And a California physician is, uh, as we understand it, an MD or a DO, uh, an actual physician. Can't be a chiropractor, can't be a nurse practitioner, for example. This is for 3212.86. Number three is there has to be a diagnosis test time proximity. That means that the diagnosis or the test has to be done within 14 days after an actual work day. So if the employee has been off on vacation for 14 days, for two weeks, um, and at the end of the vacation uh, was diagnosed with uh, COVID-19, if they hadn't actually worked for the employer within 14 days, then the presumption would not apply. The final criteria is workplace proximity. The workday has to have that workday within 14 days has to have occurred at the employer's place of employment, not the employee's home or residence. So if the employee is working both at home or mostly at home, but also going into the office or going into the factory once in a while to check on things or retrieve papers, if they've been, uh, if that employee has been working from home for, um, 15 days, for example, and hasn't been back into the factory in over 15 days, for example, then the presumption will not apply, even if they are uh, within all, they meet all the other criteria. The, the, test, the testing must be verified. Uh, so if, um, I'm sorry, the diagnosis must be verified. And, and for the presumption to apply, there has to be a positive test one way or the other, even if it starts with only a diagnosis. So the employee can trigger the presumption by having a positive COVID-19 test or can trigger the presumption by having a diagnosis of COVID-19 without a contemporaneous test. But if the latter happens, if it's just a diagnosis, that diagnosis must be confirmed by subsequent testing within 30 days of the diagnosis or else the presumption does not apply. So if the employee um, fails to get that follow-up test to verify the diagnosis within 30 days, or if that test comes back negative, um, either way, the presumption does not apply. Even if, it, even if a doctor at one point thought 
and did diagnose COVID-19. Section 3212.87 is the, the next section. So 3212.86 basically enacts the governor's executive order and it applies uh, for injuries up through July 5, 2020. Section 3212.87 uh, picks up, as does 3212.88, the next one that we'll cover. Both those pick up uh, for injuries occurring on or after July 6, 2020. So there's a bright line between uh, 3212.86, which is basically the executive order through July 5, 2020, and then after uh, July 5, starting July 6, 2020, we're going to be looking to 3212.87 or 88 um, when we're looking for the which presumption might apply. 3212.87 would be applicable only to peace officers, deputy sheriffs and police officers, for example, firefighters and certain healthcare workers, including some home healthcare workers. Those are defined in the statute pretty pretty carefully and clearly. So if you're you have a claim after July 6, 2020, involving a um, healthcare worker or home healthcare worker. It's worth taking a look at the statute to see if the specific requirements are met. Both these statutes, as I said, are for injuries on or after July 6, 2020. So, what's the criteria for 3212.87? It's very similar to 3212.86 and the executive order. So, at least there's uh, a continuity there. It still requires that there be work time proximity, um, a positive test or diagnosis, test diagnosis time proximity, and workplace proximity. The difference is this statute, 3212.87, allows for that diagnosis to be made not only by a physician, but also by a licensed physician's assistant or licensed nurse practitioner, both working within the confines of his or her licensure. So now that positive diagnosis can be made by a physician's assistant or a nurse practitioner in addition to a physician and then subsequently verified by testing within 30 days. Another thing that's different in 3212.87 and 0.88 is that testing um, is actually defined for the first time. The, or, or I should say more rigor, rigorously defined. The statutes say that the test, when they mean test or testing for COVID-19, they mean the PCR test, which is the uh, COVID-19 test currently in use, or some other COVID-19 test approved for use uh, either on a regular or emergency basis by the FDA, uh, specifically for the purpose of detecting the presence of viral RNA. So. Um, now we know exactly what the test has to be. It's worth double checking that that is the test result you're looking at when this comes up. Because what the test does not include is um, serologic testing, also known as antibody testing. Those uh, are, if you've followed in the media, they're pretty well known to be unreliable. Um, and as a result, though the legislature uh, specifically excluded them as a basis to trigger the presumption. So. If the employee for, again, this is for injuries after July, uh, on or after July 6, 2020. The executive order and 3212.86 do not have this test uh, definition. So it's still okay for an antibody test, presumably, to be used to trigger the presumption for a uh, injury bef uh, before July 6, 2020. However, I would argue if those, if in litigating those cases, I would argue that if it's based on an antibody test, that here's pretty good evidence that even the California legislature doesn't think antibody testing is accurate. So if the employee was covered by the uh, presumption under the executive order and um, they were diagnosed and had a, an antibody test that was positive within 30 days after that diagnosis, and that's what they're relying on to trigger the presumption, I would definitely um, use that as a, a point for settlement or take that case to trial to judge whether the uh, antibody testing in question was accurate or not. Because as of July 6, 2020, injuries uh, and after, that test is uh, specifically excluded 
So there's a limited time to act. This is uh, as as has existed under the executive order, continues to exist under 3212.86, which enacts the executive order or would if it's signed by the governor, uh, and also 3212.87 applying to peace officers and healthcare workers and firefighters. Uh, you only have 30 days to act on that claim, only 30 days to accept or deny that claim. Uh, if the claim is not denied within 30 days uh, of the claim form being filed, then the uh, injury is presumed compensable uh, under the labor code. So rather than 90 days, there's only 30 days to act. That's a very tiny window of time for both the claims adjuster and the employee who needs to cooperate with the claims adjuster and provide medical releases probably and uh, send over information and you know hand over that test result and uh, answer questions uh, during an investigation. If they're not cooperative within that time frame, it could jeopardize their claim because the adjuster is uh, as an obligation to act very quickly under this law. Um, Claims not timely denied within 30 days can only be rebutted by evidence subsequent uh, to that 30-day time frame. So only uh, information that's subsequently uh, discovered can be used to rebut the presumption. Okay, so that's the, the first two parts of SB 1159, 3212.86 and 3212.87. Um, the far more complicated part of this uh, legislation is 3212.88. So we have now covered um, the executive order and 0.86, which covers injuries up through July 5, 2020. And we know that peace officers, firefighters, certain healthcare workers are covered for injuries beginning July 6, 2020 under 3212.87. But what about all the other employees in California? That's where 3212.88 comes in. It also applies for injuries on or after July 6, 2020, and it does exclude those employees already covered under 3212.87. It also excludes very tiny California employers who have basically four or fewer employees. So the, the, the tiniest um, shop or restaurant or um, business would be would not be covered by this presumption, and basically their employees do not have any presumption. But if there is a, if the California employer has five or more employees, which is a whole heck of a lot of California employers, they are covered by this presumption or their employees are. The second limitation is that um, the presumption only applies to claims where there has been an outbreak of COVID-19 in that employer's place of business. And um, parsing the word outbreak is what we're probably going to be doing, or I know we're going to be doing for uh, the next several slides because it's it's a it's a pretty compl complicated uh, concept. So how do you decide if there's been a uh, an, an outbreak trigger that would trigger the presumption? First, it starts with employer obligations. So the employer has certain obligations that the employer has to do regardless of whether a claim form is being filed. So what 3212.88 does is it places particular burdens on small employers, medium-sized employers, and others. Um, because once an employer has an employee, again, this is employers with five or more workers, has an employee who tests positive, then the employer has to send written notification via electronic transmission or facsimile to the claims ex examiner or claims adjuster within three business days of suspecting that any employee has tested positive. Now, for some of these very small employers, they may not have never had a workers' compensation claim ever, and they may not even know who their workers' comp claims adjuster is. It's, it's sort of an afterthought. Maybe the, the workers' comp coverage is included in their payroll service or uh, included in some package of insurance that their broker provided them, and they may have never been in contact with their claims adjuster and may have um, you know, no idea what that person's email address or facsimile is, but they'll have to learn very quickly if this, if they have any employee who tests positive, because they have only three business days to then transmit a bunch of information to that claims adjuster. The written notification 
has to include um, very specific information, but one part that's quite concerning is that it cannot provide any personally identifiable information regarding the employee who tested positive. So this is unusual in communications between employers and their claims adjusters in the workers' compensation context, because usually um, the identification of the employee is at the very beginning of that communication process. You know, for example, if a, somebody, an employee walks in and has a back injury uh, and, and uh, they fill out a, the employee employer gives them a claim form and they fill it out and the employer's first communication to the claims adjuster transmitting that claim form and maybe some other details is all, it has the employee's name all over it and has to in order for that claim to be processed. What's happening here is the legislature has put a burden on employers to communicate with their claims adjuster, but to basically um, not disclose any of that personally identifiable information. So the employer cannot send a transmittal and say, I'm letting you know that my um, my secretary, Bob, tested positive for COVID-19 that may be work related. Can't use Bob's name, can't even, probably can't even say it's your secretary because Everybody knows that Bob is your secretary or could know easily by searching your business. And that's personally identifiable information. It's not allowed. So the only way that the employer can identify that employee is if the employee at, at the same time asserts that the infection is work related. So that could be the filing of a claim form. So if the employee walks in and hands the employer a DWC-1 claim form claiming COVID-19 related uh, illness, now the employer can communicate personally identifiable information, can let the claims adjuster know the employee's name. But otherwise, if there's that's not being asserted with a claim form in writing or, or at least verbally, um, then the employer has to be quiet about who is uh, who they're actually talking about when it comes to that positive test. So the employer's notification data has to include um, basically two sets of data. One is that the uh, identification of the employee's specific place of employment, address or addresses of that specific place or places of employment during the 14 day period preceding the date of the employee's positive test. So Bob walks in with his positive test result, maybe it's dated yesterday or the day before yesterday. Now the employer has to look back 14 days prior to that positive test result and verify in writing to the claims adjuster the address or addresses of those place that place or those places of employment where Bob has been uh, in the 14 days preceding that date. If there are several locations uh, for this employer, and Bob, one of Bob's jobs is to go around and, um, you know, I don't know, do take some sort of inventory at these different places. Um, Bob may have visited all of them, and then in all of those places of business within that 14 days have to be identified. Uh, when communicating with the claims adjuster. The second piece of data, if that weren't enough, um, is that the employer has to uh, identify the total number of employees at a particular job site over a 45-day period preceding the last day the employee worked there. So 14 days prior to the date of the positive test, but the employee may have actually worked after the positive test, or um, maybe maybe those two days line up. But this is a different time frame. This is a 45-day period of time preceding the employee um, work, uh, preceding the employee's test, or I'm sorry, preceding the employee's last day of work at that location. So we're not the employer doesn't have to disclose the names of all those other employees at that particular job site, just the total number. So the employer has to add up the total number of people who have gone into that facility within that 45 days preceding uh, Bob's last day of work. Now, some employers, some especially large, very data sophisticated or technologically sophisticated employers track this information about their employees because certain employees have to key in and key out to get in and out of locations or punch in and punch out or on a time card. But there's ways of controlling that, that data 
And that may be an afterthought to just compile this information and you know push a button. Now you've got it. But for smaller employers, mid signers employers, or employers who you know aren't in the tech business, this this kind of information may not be regularly tracked. So going after it's going to require quite a bit of investigation to try to figure out the total number of employees at a particular location um, and all of the places where a particular employee has worked within 14 days figure all that out and compile it into a coherent written communication to the claims adjuster and get all of that done within three business days. That's what the law tells us to do. Why must we do that? Pretty onerous task because if the employer forgets to timely submit this data or makes a clerical error in reporting this data, it can result in a $10,000 penalty against the employer for each violation. That's really quite startling. If there's uh, multiple pieces of error or data points that are, that are not quite correct or one employee off, uh, presumably that's a $10,000 penalty per violation or could be. All right, what is the employer, I'm sorry, the adjuster supposed to do once they get this information from the employer? Now the adjuster with this data is tasked with the job of determining on a rolling and continuous basis whether there has been an outbreak. And an outbreak exists if within 14 calendar days, one of the following occurs at a specific place of employment. If the employer has 100 or less employees, so we're talking about mid-size and small employers, then and at a specific place of employment. So this could also include large employers, but where they have um, 100 or fewer employees at a specific location. So maybe, for example, like a retail store with a large chain uh, like The Gap or um, you know, any a Kmart, maybe there's uh, 100 or fewer employees um, at a specific, specific store, like a restaurant or restaurant chain like, chain like McDonald's, there may be 100 or fewer employees at that particular store, and presumably that specific place of employment is what we're talking about. And in those situations, if four employees have tested positive for COVID-19 within 14 days, that's considered to be an outbreak. And again, this is a determination that's made by the claims administrator. If the employer has more than 100 employees at a specific place of employment, so now we're talking about a big retail store or a very large restaurant or a factory, then 4%, if 4% if of the number of employees who reported to that specific place of employment test positive for COVID-19, then that constitutes an outbreak. The final outbreak, the fire, or um, uh, 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 choice is if the specific place of employment is ordered closed by a local public health department. State Department of Public Health, uh, the OSHA, or a school super. So, if any one of those things attendant has closed a school due to the risk of COVID-19 infection, health so events, the claims closed. administrator is keeping track. Of the, um, if any one of those events happens, the claims administrator is tracking that data uh, and all along and determining: okay, you've just reached number four employee for your place of business. That means you now have an outbreak. And once that outbreak occurs, then all of those claims have to be um, looked at as statutory presumption. Um, so it's, it's quite a bit of, of data tracking that has to go on here. What is a specific place of employment? I talked about that a little bit, but it's, the statute is defined it as a building, a store, a facility, an agricultural field where an employee performs work. So fairly, fairly well understood. If an employee works in multiple locations, then the presumption would apply to an out if an outbreak exists at any one of those locations. So if you have an uh, employee who, for example, works in two different agricultural fields and um, 
there's what consider what's considered to be an outbreak at any one at one of those fields, then the employee is covered by the presumption, even if they only work at that field part of part of the time. Further, if these positive tests um, shall be counted for purposes of determining outbreak at all those locations. So if you have your agricultural worker who works in two different fields, that worker tests positive for COVID-19, then the claims adjuster is tracking the uh, question of whether there's an for both fields applies employees a positive test to both fields. So let's say there's few than one report to either one of those fields. Now with one employee who works in both fields tests positive, that one employee's positive test counts towards those four to define an outbreak in both fields, in both locations. Specific place of employment does not include the employee's home or residence. So that's, that's carried over from the executive order. And we understand that um, home or residence is generally excluded when it comes to this presumption. Um, and that's a picture of a little kitty trying to help someone uh, work from home. Unless the employee's uh, employee provides home health care services to another individual at the employee's home or residence. And that happens sometimes. Some home health care workers um, do uh, provide home health care with uh, people who live with them or, or uh, provide that service within their own homes. That employee would be covered. Now, home health care workers important to realize they're they're specifically triggered here in this instance under 3212.88 but they may also be covered by 3212.87 depends on their specific home health care uh, duties so that's how these cases under 3212.88 and how this data collection goes looking forward but what about the time frame between when the executive order uh, expired back on July 6, 2020 or thereabouts and the day that this uh, law becomes uh, becomes law, the day that this bill is signed into law. What happens to all of those, that time frame since July 6, 2020? We know what to do going forward. It's not easy, but we understand. What do we do looking backwards? And this is a whole separate burden that's placed on employers I call it the employer's retrospective review. What that means is the employer has to now, first thing they have to do is look backwards um, to review all past COVID-19 cases or claims uh, or te positive tests for any employee who tested positive on or after July 6, 2020. So now the employer is basically going to go back and report and look at all of those positive test results and report to the claims adjuster the required outbreak data uh, for that time frame. And they have to do that retrospective review within 30 days of the effective date of the statute. If the governor signs this statute tomorrow, then the 30 days start that day. And the, each and every employer has to go back and do this retrospective review. I should say each and every employer with five or more employees has to do this retrospective review as soon as this law is uh, become, once, as soon as this bill becomes law. Um, the adjuster also has work to do retrospectively. Once the employer within 30 days gives the claims adjuster this data for all of their positive testing um, from July 6, 2020 until the bill's enactment, then the claims adjuster compiles all that data and has to retrospectively determine or retroactively determine if an outbreak has occurred at the employer's facility, let's say, sometime in August, and then readjust those claims that the adjuster was had dealt with already. Maybe the adjuster had already denied that claim because the, did the, the executive order presumption didn't apply um, because it was a, an August 1st injury, for example. Um, but now, it turns out, based on the data that the employer provides, it looks like there was actually an outbreak um, at the employer's place of business or the location where that employee worked back in August, on August 1st, then the adjuster is required to revisit that case and retroactively determine whether, whether the outbreak has occurred and thereby apply the presumption. 
and, and readjust that claim to decide whether, in fact, it should be accepted uh, in light of the presumption. Not an easy task. So if the adjuster concludes that an outbreak has occurred, then the presumption would apply retroactively to that uh, location. This must be continually evaluated um, to determine whether the requisite number of positive tests have occurred within the surrounding 14-day periods. So again, this is a rolling 14 days where uh, outbreak uh, employers' place of business may go in and out of outbreak status. There's a limited time to act uh, under 3208. Point, I'm sorry, 3212.88. Uh, but instead of 30 days, the employer is uh, given 45 days to either accept or reject the claim. As with 3212.87, the presumption would extend following termination of service for a period of 14 days, commencing with the last date actually worked in the specific capacity at the employer's place of employment. So both 3212.87 and 3212.88 follow the employee uh, for 14 days, the presumption does, even after that employee is retires, quits, is fired, they still are entitled to that presumption for an additional 14 days. Again, 45 days to accept or deny the case under 3212.88. How do you rebut a presumption? So let's say we went through all of this hard work and we've decided that the presumption applies. Does that, is that the end of the discussion? Does that mean the claim has to be accepted? Um, and the answer is no, it doesn't have to be accepted. The, the, the presumptions are, all of these presumptions are rebuttable. There was talk of, and there were actually bills which did not pass the legislature. Uh, in, in At least at, at some point in time, there were versions of bills that had conclusive presumptions in them, but none of those passed the legislature. All of these presumptions, the executive order, and all sections that we've discussed under uh, SB 1159 or proposed sections, all of those are rebuttable presumptions. The claims, even if the presumption applies, the claims can be denied if the employer can show that the risks of workplace infection are not particular to, particular to or characteristic of the claimant's specific employment and or if there was a known or likely non-industrial cause, such as an infected family member or housemate. That, that evidence can be used to rebut the presumption because it's, it's, it's basically the employer recognizing that the employer has the burden of proof and then carrying that burden of proof with evidence to show that in fact this COVID-19 was not contracted at work. So long as current medical information indicates that COVID-19 is a risk to the general public, we know that to be true. You'd only have to pick up a newspaper to know that that's going on. There are plenty of uh, folks who have COVID-19 that have that, that have never worked. So for example, some children or, or that have been retired for many years, like some older folks. Having a job doesn't make you more likely to get COVID-19. No, I'm not aware of any data that says so. So that means that COVID-19 is a risk to the general public. Um, and while that's true, and seems to be that's going to remain true, uh, there's a basis to investigate and determine whether that infection came from somewhere else. As noted under 3212.88, evidence to rebut the presumption can include measures that the employer has taken um, to reduce potential transmission of COVID-19 in the employee's place of employment. So for example, if the employer has done uh, what a lot of employers are doing, requiring their employees to wear face covering while working, requiring the employee to keep six feet apart from coworkers, requiring that um, employees wash and sanitize their hands when operating uh, equipment or sharing um, office supplies or sharing office machinery. Um, disinfectants available for their use, limiting uh, employees to um, one at a time in the uh, in the break room. 
all of those measures are relevant for purposes of rebutting the presumption. So hopefully the employer has in place uh, a protocol that um, the employees are posted in the workplace and it's been distributed to all the employees. And hopefully the protocol is pretty, um, is enforced and we can prove that. And if we can, then it's 3212.80 specifically says that this is relevant information to rebut the presumption. Because if the employer is keeping the workplace safe, the fact that any one or more employees happen to get COVID-19 doesn't necessarily mean they got it from work. It just means that they are also members of the public who can, can contract this disease and may have done so outside of work. So it's it's really relevant. And I would I would say that gathering that information from employers is uh, claims adjusters really their first step. What do you have in, what measures do you have in place? What are your written criteria for keeping the workplace safe? Because that all becomes relevant in rebutting these presumptions. So should the employer offer a claim form to every employee who becomes infected with COVID-19? We know that the employer, once they learn that an employee has become infected, with COVID-19. We know that the employer has an obligation under 3212.88, or most employers do, to communicate that to the claims adjuster right away uh, within three days. But do they have to also hand the employee a claim form? The answer is yes. You have to offer the employee a claim form. So if the employee walks in and says, uh, Bob walks in and says to uh, his boss, hey, I've, I've I've tested positive for COVID-19, I want to let you know, or calls in and says, hey, I'm I'm calling in sick, I feel, I've feel i just been diagnosed with COVID-19 without saying that it was caused by work. Uh, so Bob calls in and uh, tells that to his supervisor. Supervisor has a, and the employer has a duty to transmit that information to the claims adjuster because they have a, a an employee who tested positive. Uh, but that supervisor, she also has to give Bob a, a DWC-1 claim form if Bob is covered by the presumption or if Bob is doing a high-risk job. And we'll talk about what those high-risk jobs are. Either way, the employer has to provide a claim form without being asked for one. So if Bob is working at a place where there's an outbreak and he's covered by the presumption, then uh, regardless of whether Bob thinks it's work-related or not, the employer has to give Bob a claim form. It's still Bob's choice whether to file that claim form, but the employer has a duty under Labor Code Section 5400 to provide a claim form to every employee within 24 hours if the um, employer believes that there might be a work-related injury. And if the presumption applies, or if the employee is working in a high-risk job, in my, it's my position and our position that the uh, duty to provide the claim form is triggered. Now, if the presumption does not apply, so there's not an outbreak in, in the workplace, or Bob is not a police officer, or he's not in a high-risk job, he's a secretary. So if the presumption does not apply, then the employer is not required to provide a claim form just because an employee has tested positive for COVID-19. Uh, so absent a presumption, absent a high-risk job, um, no duty to provide a claim form. Now, that said, I always advise employers to um, make claim forms available should an employee ask for one. That's perfectly okay. Uh, but what we're talking about here is the employer's duty to um, affirmatively offer a claim form just because somebody has tested positive for COVID-19. So which jobs are high risk? I just mentioned that. And take a look at this pyramid while well, I have a cup of a uh, sip of tea. So these are the high risk jobs under the uh, OSHA COVID-19 hazard recognition page, which um, uh, which I just looked at uh, again in preparation for this slide and have been following what that page says and all the OSHA information. This is the pyramid that they created to define the types of jobs or to demonstrate the types of jobs uh, that are materially at a greater risk of contracting COVID-19. So some employees are gonna be covered by the presumption, 
with or without a presumption, some employees are in a high-risk job or one that's at high risk of contracting COVID-19. And sometimes those high-risk employees are also covered by the presumption. Um, so let's talk about what to do under those circumstances. So there are some jobs, as we say, start with, there are some jobs that are very high risk, some jobs that are high risk, most jobs that are either medium or low risk of contracting COVID-19 in the workplace. High risk occupations, those that are high risk or very high risk, include healthcare and medical transit, uh, medical transport workers who directly care for or are otherwise exposed to known or suspected COVID-19 patients. Okay, that's, we can all pretty much uh, agree that those are high risk jobs for contracting COVID-19. Um, but also a healthcare or laboratory personnel who collect or handle specimens from known or suspected COVID-19 patients. So this could be people who work in the testing centers. Those are the those first two are the are the enumerated jobs that are uh, high risk. Now there's a whole list of other jobs which may be at an increased risk of exposure uh, to COVID-19 based on job ex specific job exposure circumstances. So this could be law enforcement. It could be sanitation workers, it could be uh, other employees, depending on the circumstances. It could even be certain, certain retail workers. It can be others whose jobs place them at an increased risk of exposure, and that all depends on the circumstances. So we know that the enumerated uh, first two bullet points here, those enumerated people are definitely at high risk. You don't really have to dig much deeper to know about their specific job to know they're at high risk. Uh, but for other, all other workers, you might have to dig a little deeper and find out what they were doing specifically in their job to find out if they're at higher risk. And, and when we say higher risk, we're talking about exposure to, as part of the job, exposure to people who are known or suspected COVID-19 carriers. So which claims do you accept or deny with, once you have this information? Claims should be accepted if the employee is in a job that puts them at a high risk or very high risk of contracting COVID-19 if the presumption applies. So if the employee falls under the presumption and they fit within one of these high risk or very high risk job categories, then that's two pieces of information which pretty much make this a cut and dry case and it should be accepted. So if you have a healthcare worker who is covered by um, 3212.87, they are uh, not just any old healthcare worker, but one of the ones that's covered by COVID by the presumption, but also at high risk for COVID-19. Maybe it's a, a nurse who is uh, dealing with COVID-19 patients uh, and caring for them. That claim, and they follow workers' compensation claim for contracting COVID-19. Those two pieces of information, the presumption and the fact that they're in a high risk job, that's enough to accept the injury uh, and call it a day. All other claims can be delayed and investigated in all other cases. So if the presumption does not apply, uh, I'm sorry, can be delayed and investigated in all other cases. So um, if the, even if the presumption applies, but the employee is not necessarily in a high risk or very high risk job uh, classification, then the claim can be delayed and the adjuster can ask, Again, does the employer have in place measures to reduce the potential transmission of COVID-19 in the workplace? Um, and also, is there evidence of claimants' non-occupational risks outside of work? For example, is there a family member who has had COVID-19 and exposed them to it? Um, have they been out in the public um, and exposing themselves to COVID-19? Those are relevant questions to be looked at during the delay time for any of those folks who, even if the presumption applies, even if a presumption applies to ask those questions and investigate that claim, so long as they are not in a high risk or very high risk job. So which presumptive claims to deny? Yes, you can still deny claims that fall under the presumption. Um, if the employee's job is not considered to be high risk or very high risk of contracting COVID-19 by OSHA, uh, even if the presumption applies, the claim can be denied if the employee fails to cooperate in the investigation. And that's true across the board and still remains true. 
for uh, workers' compensation claims. The employee has to cooperate. Uh, if they fail to cooperate, and as a result, you can't finish the investigation within that 30, 30 days, the claim could be denied till you get the investigation completed. Or if the employer had, can, had gathers enough evidence to prove that the workplace exposure was not the medically probable cause of contracting the viral infection in that case, the presumption can be rebutted and that claim can be denied. So for example, if the employer has in place uh, social distancing and other measures to control the spread of the disease within the workplace, and if the employee is not in a high risk job, and if the employee uh, works in this safe work environment, but travels to and from work in an, in an unsafe environment or without social distancing, or lives in a in a in a uh, in a residence where there's there's you know no measures are taking place and they're free, freely um, socialized with neighbors and friends and so on and so forth, and maybe even there's evidence that some of those neighbors or friends have already have COVID-19 or came down with it within within time within a recent time after contact being in contact with that employee. Those are that's pretty good evidence that they that the claim can be denied even if the presumption applies because it does, that's evidence that rule will, will rebut the presumption. Yes, claims can be denied even in the face of the presumption if we do investigate the case correctly and, and the um, evidence is, is sufficient to convince the workers' compensation judge that it's uh, not work-related. Uh, part of that investigation can include disclosure of medical records and statements taken uh, regarding off-duty exposure. So we, I know that some claims adjusters have been getting resistance from employees who do not want to talk about their off-duty exposure. That's failure to cooperate in the investigation because that's very relevant to determine whether the presumption can be rebutted, whether the claim is compensable. Uh, medical records are essential. So the, the actual copy of the positive test result, the diagnosis records, treatment records, all of that is relevant um, and may require an employee to sign a release to, to get them and, and probably has to be acted on very quickly to get those records in hand uh, within that 30 day or 45 day investigation period. Speaking of, remember only 30 days or 45 days to act under these presumptions. So for the executive order for 3212.86 and for 3212.87, which applies to safety and certain healthcare workers, only 30 days to accept or deny that claim. For claims under 3212.88, that's the outbreak presumption, only 45 days for the adjuster to uh, deny those claims or else they're presumed compensable. Now, because of this tiny window of time, it makes sense for employers uh, and adjusters to act on any COVID-19 claim within that limited time frame. Which limited time frame? Well, if it looks like this is going to be a safety officer or healthcare worker covered by 3212.87, or potentially, maybe it's a safety officer, or maybe it's a healthcare worker that fits under that definition. You're not entirely sure. Act within 30 days on that claim, just to be certain, because if if you decide the presumption doesn't apply and decide to you know do your investigation and deny the claim within 90 days. If it's ultimately determined that the presumption did apply, then that claim is unti that denial is untimely. Um, and for employees where there might potentially be an outbreak, maybe you're not sure if there's an outbreak or not, maybe you haven't finished compiling that data. Nevertheless, deny the claim within 45 days if you're going to deny it. Don't wait for the full 90, even if you think a presumption does not apply, because it may turn out that the presumption did apply and then the denial is untimely. Okay, let's talk about the benefits that uh, are awarded under or potentially awarded under these presumptions. Um, the executive order and the presumptions under 1159 both expand and place limits on workers' compensation benefits. In all of these laws, there's a sick leave offset. I say laws, I mean the executive order and the bill that may soon become law. There's a sick leave offset. So if the employer has paid sick leave benefits specifically available in response to COVID-19, those benefits shall be used and exhausted before any temporary disability or labor code so 40, section 4850 pay is due and payable. So the sick leave offset remains in place. Um, 
If the employee does not have that sick leave uh, available, then TD or 4850 have to kick in from the date of the disability. There are temporary disability limited limits for COVID-19 cases that don't apply uh, necessarily in other cases. Uh, one is that TD or Labor Code Section 4850 benefits, for those to be paid, the employee must be certified for TD within the first 15 days after the initial diagnosis. So the, the TD period of TD can't come more than 15 days after they were diagnosed with COVID-19. Then they have to be recertified for temporary disability every 15 days thereafter for the first 45 days following the diagnosis. However, there's no three-day waiting period for temporary disability under COVID-19 presumptions. So this, this is going back in time to uh, May. If an employee tested positive or was diagnosed prior to um, May 6, 2020, then the employee has other uh, requirements. This is in the executive order, and it's also in 3212.86, which codifies the executive order. So we're really looking back now to um, te positive testing or diagnosis before May 6. By the way, May 6 was when the executive order was enacted or signed. So that's why that that's where that date comes from. So the employee must um, obtain a TD certificate by May 21, 2020. If they haven't done that already, it's too late. Uh, and then they have to be recertified every 15 days thereafter for the first 45 days following the diagnosis. So one piece of good news, I suppose, is that uh, presumption laws do not uh, restrict apportionment, these presumption laws. Other presumption laws do. The heart presumption, the cancer presumption, and other presumptions um, have a restriction under Labor Code Section 4663E, a restriction that limits apportionment uh, or prohibits apportionment to non-industrial factors. But under these COVID-19 presumptions, there is no such restriction. So apportionment is allowed, apportionment of permanent disability in all these cases. So that's that should also be part of the investigation. Did the employee, looking at the medical records, did the employee have a pre-existing condition that the COVID-19 aggravated uh, that contributed to the uh, impairment or disability? And if so, it's relevant for apportionment purposes. Under, uh, under these presumption statutes, death benefits continues to be applicable as it normally does if an employee dies because of a presumed compensable COVID-19 infection. However, uh, the death benefit payment that would otherwise be due to the Department of Industrial relations when the employee dies without any dependence is not due or is waived under these presumptions. Okay, so we know what's involved in determining whether, for example, there's been an outbreak, whether the employee fits within certain classes of uh, employees that are covered by uh, the presumptions. What if the presumption does not apply? So what if there's no outbreak or we're talking about um, a situation where the uh, employee is at a small employer or doesn't fit within the safety officer or healthcare classifications of 3212.87. So there's no presumption, but they have COVID-19 and they make a worker's compensation claim. What do you do with that claim? Probably deny it. If the presumption does not apply, and again, this is why the legislature passed these laws, because it is very difficult to prove that a communicable uh, contagious disease that is readily um, transmitted within the general public, it's very difficult to prove that uh, th that was contracted at any one particular place. It's, it's almost scientifically impossible. And there's uh, the, the California workers' compensation system has been dealing with infectious diseases that are claimed to be industrial for around 100 years. And the uh, state Supreme Court has addressed this um, in a couple of cases I've cited there and probably others, and said that uh, 
and if, if an employee contracts a disease while employed or becomes disabled from the natural progression of a non-industrial disease during employment, this will not establish a causal connection. And, I, and this language is particularly strong. It says an ailment does not become an occupational disease simply because it was con contracted on the employer's premises. Okay, so basically the state Supreme Court has said just because you caught it or just because you're exposed to it at work, even if we were, doesn't mean that you got it from work. Could have come from somewhere else or that the transmission of a communicable disease uh, at the workplace doesn't make it a work-related injury. So if the presumption does not apply, there's pretty strong um, uh, case law to uh, support denial of that uh, COVID-19 claim. Now, again, it's advisable to act on any COVID-19 claim within 30 or 45 days, depending on which uh, presumption might potentially apply, even though we have up to 90 days to um, accept or deny that claim if the presumption does not apply. It's just good to be in the habit of dealing with those claims within 30 or 45 days. And again, you never know, uh, a workers' comp judge might find that, the, that despite all evidence to the contrary, that a presumption does apply in a particular case, and then that, that denial would be untimely. So what about work from home implications? And there are some. Um, what about an employee who is instructed to stay and work from home, as many have been during the pandemic, but is exposed while working at home to a household member who has COVID-19? And maybe they wouldn't have been exposed to that household member had they themselves not been told to work from home. Well, it's probably not covered by any of the presumptions because work from home is excluded under all of these uh, under the executive order and under all of the uh, subsections of uh, SB 1159. So working from home is not going to be covered by the presumption. Uh, the claim should probably, the work from home claim should probably be delayed and probably denied um, within 30 or 45 days, even though the 90 days arguably is allowed. Uh, because exposure does not equal injury. So just because they're working from home and exposed by uh, while working at home to someone who has it doesn't make it work-related. Uh, moreover, the employee would need to really prove that they, let's say they have a family member who is homesick with COVID-19, they'd have to prove that the uh, contraction occurred while the employee was actually working as opposed to while the person was just living at the house, you know, sitting next to that infected person on the couch watching TV. The uh, order and the presumption laws do create um, potential exposure for third-party business liability. Um, so for example, an employee who's covered by the presumption uh, may go home and expose family members or members of the community to the illness. And if that happens, uh, that could be traceable back to the employer if there is a presumption. So this, this, uh, these, these presumptions may create more business exposure than just more workers' compensation dollars out the door, which is a certainty that they will do that. Uh, it may also expose employers to third-party liability. Okay, that's a lot of material, and you may have some questions. Uh, you may very much want a copy of this PowerPoint PDF, which we're happy to send to you. Uh, just send an email to your uh, nearest RTGR law office or just pick one if you don't want to figure out the geography uh, and we're happy to send you uh, the PDF and we're happy to answer any specific questions you may have. Again, the most senior attorneys at each one of those offices, this email goes directly to that person and that person is uh, uh, has a copy of the PDF and is ready to answer your questions. Uh, if you're a claims adjuster and you would like continuing education claims credit for attending this program, uh, again, just email your nearest RTGR law office, uh, one-stop shop, and we're happy to um, send you a certificate for completing this training. Um, your certificate of attendance will be in a PDF format as well. You can, you can do all three things. You can ask your question about COVID-19, you can get a PDF copy of this uh, program, and you can get your certificate of attendance um, all by emailing your closest RTGR Law Office. Uh, we'll be happy to send that to you.
Um, we're going to keep following this. Of course, we're going to let you know when uh, and if the governor signs SB 1159 into law. We're also going to follow other changes in the law, as we always do, involving, uh, lo and behold, issues even beyond and aside from COVID-19. We uh, post that regularly on our blog. Um, you can go to rtgrlaw.com and you'll find our blog where we post updates. You can also uh, connect with us on LinkedIn on our RTGR Law page. Uh, that's a, we always post everything that we, all of our legal updates there as well. Or if you are a Twitter user, you can follow us on Twitter and we always post there as well. So those are all ways that you can stay updated. Um, our firm prides itself on tackling really the most challenging claims and controversies, which is why we're all over COVID-19 because it's very complicated and very challenging. Um, and when it comes to workers' comp and civil subrogation and employment law, we, uh, we invite the most complicated and the most uh, troubling matters that you may have as an employer or adjuster, uh, and we're happy to um, tackle those challenges for you and help you through that um, and uh, come out the other side. Thank you so much for attending this program. Um, I'm going to go back to the slide with our uh, email addresses, so you have that right in front of you. As we conclude, um, please uh, uh, stay in touch and please stay safe. Uh, and hopefully, we'll be uh, li having life return to a little bit normal in the near future. I'm, I'm hoping for that for all of us. Thank you for attending.